Now this is a very important cause to be engaged with at this moment in your certificate course. But maybe let's begin by defining that word, alright? Uh, surely by now you would be familiar with those titles. You know, we talk about theology, we're talking about theologos, the doctrine of God. When we're talking about um, I said I want to talk about anthropology, which we just finished. Anthropon, man, logos, study about or words about, so anthropologos, anthropology means the study of man, words about man, but particularly that study as it relates to sin or the fall of man. So you're dealing with Christology, you're dealing with two, a compound of two words. Okay. Christ is the Greek word which translates a Hebrew word Messiah. Hmm? Messiah, the sent one. Who is the Messiah in the Old Testament? Who is it? Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. The Messiah. Now that word Messiah is a Hebrew word, Mashiach or Hamashiach, the Messiah, which is the equivalent of the Greek word Christ or Christos. So the Hebrews, when they talk about the Messiah, I mean Christ, they're talking about Messiah. The Greeks refer to him as Christos, which we anglicize by the word Christ. So, Christ is the Messiah. Obviously, in terms of um, the study of that word, particularly in its meaning, Messiah meant the chosen one. Okay? <coughs> chosen one. Okay, you could also say anointed. Alright. The chosen one, the anointed one, God's special messenger. That's Messiah. The Greek is Christos, Christ. The Messiah, the Christ. So really, in terms of uh, dealing with, and we will deal with this in later uh, discussions, when you're dealing with the names of Christ, all right? When you're dealing with the names of Christ, when you're dealing with the name Christ or Messiah, we are not really dealing with his name, but really, really we are dealing with his title. Does that make sense? When you say, Mr. Tom. Mister is not his name. Mister is a title. Are you following what I'm saying? When you say Mister, we already know he's an adult. We already know he's a male adult. So it is a title, it is a descriptive word that tells us about who he is and even perhaps what he's come to do. So the name Christ is not really a name per se, but it is more of a title. It is a title that means chosen one, anointed one, the sent one. Hmm? The one who has been sent. The one who has a special duty, a special commission from God. Whatever that may be. So in dealing with Christ, by the way, in, in the Gospels, you'd find that progressively Christ attains some kind of an elevation. 
There are days when simply he's called Jesus of Nazareth. Sometimes they call him Jesus, all right, the Son of Man. Sometimes they call him that, and so on and so forth. They call him by many different names. But there's a time through the gospel progression, through the gospel development, when they no longer call him, at least primarily not so, as Jesus of Nazareth, all right? But they begin to call him Jesus the Christ, especially after a text which we will read today in Matthew 16, I believe. We will read that text and we will discuss it a little bit. Jesus, you'll find, uh, from the revelation of Peter into who Jesus is and what his mission is, he now begins to be called Jesus the Christ. The sent one, the anointed one, right? The chosen one, the Messiah, the promised one is another word you can use here. All right? He is the one that was promised in the Old Testament. He has come. So he is Jesus, the chosen, Jesus, the anointed, Jesus, the sent one, Jesus, the promised one. Now, of course, you've got to understand that the name Jesus was really a common name in the time. You remember there was a man called by Jesus? You remember that one? So that name was there. So to distinguish Christ, the Lord, the Savior, from the many other Jesuses of his day, you have to say Jesus, the Messiah, or Jesus, the Christ, or Jesus, the Chosen One, the Anointed One, the Sent One, the Promised One. Who, which Jesus are you talking about? I'm talking about the Chosen One, the Anointed One, the Sent One, the Promised One. All right. So, but that is, that is what that word really means, Christ, Messiah. But also, we have got that word in the compound world of Christology, and this is the word Logos, which simply means the study of, or, sometimes you say, what's about. Uh -huh. So, Christologos, Christology, means the study of the Messiah, what about the Messiah? The study of Christ, what about Christ? Christology. Are we together up to that? All right. So that is really a matter of definition on this subject of Christology. The study of the chosen one, the anointed one, the sent one, the promised one, you could say the special one. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's just so much that you could say here. The special one. Which Christ are you talking about? The special one. Which one are you talking about? I'm talking about the anointed one. Which one I'm talking about? The chosen one. Well, I'm talking about the sent one, the promised one. That's the one we are talking about. So, go back there. So that's the definition then of Christology. It is the study of or what's about Christ. Who is the sent one, chosen one, the special one, the sent one, the anointed one, <laughs> and so on and so forth. But having dealt with the definition of that, I want us to move forward and deal with why should we study this doctrine? Why study Christology? Why study the doctrine of Christ? Why is this study so very important for us? Now I say to you very clearly, clearly, and the only three reasons I'm going to give here, broad reasons, The reason why we study Christology, number one, is because there is no Christianity without Christ. Excuse me. There is no Christianity without Christ. There is no Christianity without Christ. 
Let's put that in another way. Jesus Christ is at the heart of the religion called Christianity. Jesus Christ is at the heart of the religion called Christianity. So that misunderstand Christ, you will misunderstand the whole Christian religion. And we dare say, even guardedly, that if you are to apprehend Christ properly, if you are to understand Christ properly, then you are more likely to have a better handle on the religion that we call Christianity. You know, we are Christians because we follow Christ. Now the only reason why we mention that issue or bring it up is because there are people who somehow want to claim they are Christians and never believe on Christ. Now, luckily, here in Africa, particularly in this context, Western Kenya, we do not deal with this much. But there are people who say that Jesus Christ did not exist as a historical reality. He didn't exist. There was no person called Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a creation of the imagination, fanciful imagination of the disciples, of some Jews. But it was such a good idea that, it's like that, that idea became concrete in the minds of people and the imagination somehow morphed into reality. So in effect, let us not say Jesus existed, but Christianity exists because it is based on very good teachings. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others what you would want others to do unto you. These are good things. We can accept Christianity as a system of organized thought and conduct, but not Christ because Christ never existed historically. <laughs> Can those people call themselves Christians? You cannot. But over and above that, ladies and gentlemen, I've told you before, uh, maybe I've told you this class, maybe it's another class, that I met a man from Ethiopia, an exile from Ethiopia. He's in Kenya because he's suffering persecution from his homeland. Why is he being persecuted? Because he has become a Christian. He and his wife were Muslims and then they became Christian and they were arrested for becoming Christian in a Muslim sort of community. And so the wife was asked, renounce Christ. And the wife said, I cannot renounce Christ. He is my savior, he is my Lord, he has done me no wrong, I will stand with Christ. And the wife was killed. He, the man, the husband, was told, renounce Christ and you will live. And he renounced Christ. So that he lived but was sentenced to, I think 10 years or 14 years in jail. But after four years, I think, he escaped jail and came to Kenya. <coughs> Left his uh, teenage daughter back in Ethiopia. So I was talking to this man and I asked him, so are you a Christian? He said to me, yes, I am a Christian. I said, give me your testimony. He gave me his testimony of how he has suffered and how he has been persecuted for the sake of Christ, how his wife has been killed for the sake of Jesus Christ and say, oh, this is horrible. You love people like that, don't you? People that have paid the price. They have counted the cost. They have actually lost loved ones for the sake of the faith which is in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, 
But when we discussed more, this man revealed his understanding of the doctrine of Christ, his Christology. He told me, I love Christianity, but I think there is a problem with Christianity. He said, what's the problem? He said, you misunderstand Jesus Christ. You Christians say that Jesus is God or Son of God. But that is not true. I am a Christian, but I don't believe that. Jesus is simply a very great prophet. Problem, problem, problem. Bad, bad, bad. Did Jesus die? That's another problem, you see. He told me. Jesus did die. God could not allow his mighty prophet to die in the hands of people like that. Infidels, how? His face was changed and given to another man, and another man died in his place, blah, 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 blah. You know, you know the Muslim thing. And I looked him in the eye, and I said to him, my brother, you are not a Christian. You are not a Christian. You are not saved. You do not know Christ at all. For if you do not know that Christ Jesus is God, and the Son of God, and if you deny that he died, then how can you be saved? How are you saved from your sins? Who pays for your sins? So again, the misunderstanding there was on the doctrine of Christ. So we are saying Jesus Christ is at the heart of the Christian faith. I will show you later from uh, Matthew 16 that Jesus himself was very concerned that his disciples have a correct understanding of who he is. It was very important to him. He asked them, who do people say that I, the son of man, am? And they gave their answers and da-da-da, mighty prophet, da-da-da. But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? No? And of course, Peter, by divine revelation, says, you are the Christ. Son of the living God. You are the chosen one. You are the special one. You are the anointed one. You are the sent one. You are the promised one. The one we've been waiting for. You are the Messiah who is to come into the world. You are the one. And Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And on this rock, not on Peter, but on this foundation of revelation, because you have understood who I am on this rock, I will now build my church. So the church itself is built on the understanding of who Jesus is. Can you see that? Yes? Say that again. Oh, that's a nice point. I should. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Peter has a revelation of who Jesus is as the sent one, the anointed one, God's Messiah, the special one. And Jesus says to him, you couldn't have known that by means of theological learning, flesh and blood. It's by divine revelation. You have known that. And because you have known this, on this rock, what is that rock? And the Greek has a distinction between Petros, which I think is small stone, maybe I'm confusing them, and the word Petra, which is a rock. Now Peter is Petros, okay? Petra, rock. So when Jesus talks about Peter and the rock, he's not dealing with one and the same thing. He's dealing with two different things. One is a person, the other is the revelation. You have had a revelation of who I am. On this rock, on this foundation of revelation, I will build my church. But what is that revelation? It's a revelation of who Jesus is. So we say, Jesus Christ 
is at the center of the Christian faith. We must get the doctrine of Christ aright. We must. This is essential. Reason number two. I'm just introducing Christology, okay? We've not begun to discuss it. Just introducing it. Right? Just introducing it. Reason number two. And this may appear like a trite reason, but it's not. It's really significant in my view. So, say number one, Jesus Christ is at the center, at the heart of Christianity. Misunderstand Christ, you misunderstand Christianity. Misjudge Christ, you misjudge what Christianity is all about. But reason number two then, we are saying world history is interpreted from the standpoint of Christ. World history is interpreted from the standpoint of Christ. World history is interpreted from the standpoint of Christ. Now, when I draw for you something like this, okay, and then I say this is the beginning, and then I say this is the end, of course you're still going, and then I put a middle here, and then I say JC, which is Jesus Christ, okay, the cross. The period, this side, what do we call it? In technical language. Before Christ, which is abbreviated as BC. So we say 100 BC. That is 100 years before the advent of Jesus Christ. Are you following? So all the years before Christ, we usually refer to them with the words B.C., which means before Christ. Then what do we say about this uh, period after the cross, after J.C.? What abbreviations do we use? A. Say that again. A.D. What does A.D. mean? After death, not particularly, but yes, after death, you could say that. But it technically means Anno Domini. Alright? Anno Domini. The year of our Lord. Okay? Anno Domini is Latin for the year of our Lord. The year of our Lord. So really, it is supposed then that all years after Christ are years that belong to him. So, when did Augustine live? Fourth century AD. Ah. When did the Reformation happen? 15th century, 16th century AD. Right? Uh, when did uh, the World War happen? in the early part of the 20th century AD. So we refer to historical events by taking a standpoint from the person and the fact of Jesus the Christ. So if you want to understand this surely, we've got to, to be acquainted with the doctrine of Christ. Shouldn't we? Acquainted with the doctrine of Christ is important. Very, very important. Reason number three then, and this also is a rather important one in terms of uh, our reflections around the doctrine of Christ, Christology, and uh, why we must persuade ourselves, why we must convince ourselves 
that it is necessary and quite important to study this doctrine. Reason number three then I'm saying that Christianity in its broadest sense, Christianity, and I'm qualifying that, in its broadest sense, that is to say, those who are called Mary, Jane, Tom, okay, it doesn't have to mean that they are saved, okay? I'm talking of Christianity, like, you know, they say Kenya is a Christian country. Well, far from it, it's not true. But generally, because the majority, more than 80% of Kenyans, have what they call a Christian name. So they are called Christian. When they fill up forms uh, for government or for employment or for whatever reason, they say religion, they say Christian is what they tick. They don't tick Muslim or Hindu. That's the broadest sense of Christianity. Now we know better that there is a narrower sense of Christianity where only those that are born again, that are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that are effectually called justified through the faith that is in Him, those are true Christians. But we're talking about Christianity in its broadest sense. I'm saying Christianity, therefore, in its broadest sense, is the biggest religion in the world. It is the biggest religion in the world. The biggest religion in the world. Billions of people. Billions of people subscribe to the Christian faith or appellation. Arising from that statement of fact that Christianity is, in its broadest sense at least, is the biggest religion in the world, we ask the question, how do you deal with a population so large if you don't understand their faith? So for non-Christians even, there is an importance of them dealing with Christology, if not for anything, but that they are dealing with the biggest religion in the world. And how do you deal with that without understanding their faith? In technical language, therefore, we say that Christianity is an existential Reality. Christianity is an existential reality. This is a reality we cannot escape, we cannot run away from. It is beside us, in front of us, in our faces, behind us, beside us. Everywhere we turn, there is a Christian influence somewhere. Whether it be a school or a hospital or a monument built, or words in a currency, or words in the flag. We're dealing with Christianity every, every, waking, every waking hour, every, every day of our lives. So then, it is important to be abreast with what this is all about. Are we here? So that's reason number three. Why we must study Christology. Christ is so important. And I say it's not just for the Christian people, but also even for non-Christians. It does them a lot of good in terms of their dealings with the world around them to have a good understanding of this doctrine of the Messiah, the doctrine of Christ. Now we're going to the third place, the third section of our conversation together. Alright? So we've defined the doctrine of Christ. In the second place, we've asked ourselves, why must we study the doctrine of Christ? We've given three reasons. And now in the third place, I want us to discuss aspects of Christology. All right? Aspects of Christology. <laughs> aspects of Christology. Aspects of this study. Now we're going to approach this study primarily 
from two basic angles, from two basic sides. We're going to approach it from two doors, two views. We're going to be concerned in the first place with what we are calling the person of Christ. The person of Christ. That's going to be our preoccupation. The person of Christ. The person of Christ. At this point, we are concerned really with his essential identity. Who is this person called Christ? Who is he? Who is Christ? Mm. Who is Christ? No, I'm not asking the question. It's a rhetorical question. Sorry. Thanks. Who is Christ? Who is he? Now, um, we're going to find out that people really misunderstood Christ for a very long time. And in very many places, people misunderstood Christ. Christ. People misunderstood him. Grossly, grossly misunderstood him. And we say the consequence of misunderstanding him. If you misunderstand Christ, you misunderstand the whole Christian religion. You misunderstand the whole Christian religion, you're dealing with an existential reality. There's no way you're relating with the world around you. I mean, it's difficult. It's what you're saying. And here there's going to be a number of things that we're going to be concerned with. We're going to be concerned with his humanity. Because on the one hand, on the one hand, we are introduced to a figure in the Bible who is very much like us. Very much like us. He is born of a woman, just like we are born of a woman. He grows as a baby, at least the record of Luke chapter 2 tells us that. Verse 52 and onwards. He grew like a baby. Every other baby grows up. He had diapers. The Lord Jesus had diapers, if there were diapers then. You know, he soiled his clothes, like every other child will soil their clothes. He played with mud, like every other child would play with mud. And we are introduced in the Gospels to this individual who feels pain, just like we feel pain, who cries, just like we cry. He experiences sorrow, just like we experience sorrow. You know, that is evidenced more clearly in John's Gospel, chapter 11, when Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. And we are told he was moved with compassion. We saw people weeping and crying. And he wept as well. He wept. We are introduced to this man who grows tired and feels thirsty and feels hungry. John's Gospel, chapter 4. That's why he stops at the well of Samaria. And there he wants water to drink. And he sends his disciples to the town to buy food and bring back so they can satisfy their hunger and quench their thirst. And rest a bit, because the sun has been hot. We are introduced to a man who sleeps, just like we all sleep. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are introduced to a man who experiences fear and anxiety. Frequently in the Gospels, we see that. The, the, the real experience of that is in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the Mount of Olives, just at the foot of the Mount of Olives where the Lord prays so hard because he's anxious about 
the impending death is so fearful that he prays, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. I'm, I'm afraid now. And nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And the Lord God sends angels to comfort him. And you're told he prayed so fervently then that the sweat that came out of his forehead were like great drops of blood. Scientists tell us it is something that is called vessel dilation. Vessel dilation. It is when the vessels in the body swell because the heart is pumping blood at a high rate that the vessels cannot accommodate that blood and they expand and through those pores of the skin the blood oozes out, mixes with the sweat and there you have great drops of blood. Such was a terrible anguish of him. That's the man we introduced to. In John's Gospel chapter 12 and verse 27 he himself says, Now is my soul so sorrowful even unto death. So really, we are introduced to a man, isn't it? A human being. <laughs> and this is the enigma of Christ. This is the, the whole difficulty of understanding this man, Jesus. Because he's verily a human being. Now, not just the Gospels, when you come to say the book of Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 14. Actually from verse 10 all the way to verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 2. It tells us that in fact, in order to be the captain of the salvation of his people, he had to be made in every way like unto them. The saint one, the chosen one, the Messiah, the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, in every way had to be made like unto his people. So that he might be our kinsman, redeemer. Who is this man? And when we are dealing with his humanity, we are primarily concerned with the doctrine of the incarnation. And we'll talk about that in great detail as we go along. We are concerned with the doctrine of the incarnation. Our incarnation simply means becoming human, becoming flesh. Okay? This individual that is like us in every way. We are dealing with his essential identity. So frequently, throughout the Gospels, you find Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. Isn't it? Son of Man. Son of Man. Son of Man. Uh, yeah. But we also find something that is quite interesting in the discussion about the essential identity of Jesus Christ. We talk about his divinity. His divinity. In the man was God, <laughs> and in the God was the man. Because we find something of a pre existence to the human being Jesus, we find something of an eternality. A foreverness to the person of Jesus, this human being, is eternal. Now, of course, every other human being is temporal, but this one human being is eternal. Is that true? He has no beginning of days, he has no end of days. We find that this human called Jesus Christ actually makes very astounding claims. Very astounding claims. For example, he says in John chapter 8, verse 56 to 58, that before Abraham was, I am. But you are born hundreds of years after Abraham. How can you say before Abraham was, you are? What he's saying there is, I am eternal. I am before Adam, Abraham. I existed before him. 
It's an astonishing claim. But even more astonishing is when he says, before Abraham was, past tense, I am, present tense. And what he's appealing to is Exodus 3 and verse 14. When God sent Moses, and Moses tells him, who should I tell them I sent me? God tells him, tell them, I am who I am I sent you. And Jesus in John 8 uses the same title, I am. What is he saying? He's saying, I am the one who was sending Moses. No. The one who was talking to Moses there, it's me. Very astonishing place. Astounding. Completely, completely uh, amazing. This Jesus says, this human being says that I and the Father are John 14, verse 7, 8, and 9. Philip is so exasperated. He's so frustrated. <laughs> and Philip says to Jesus, you keep talking to us about the Father. You keep talking about this Father. Show us the Father for once. And it will suffice us, we'll be satisfied. Show us who is it. And Jesus, he looks at Philip and says, Philip, seriously? Are you for real? You may not have been with you all this time and you still can ask that question. If you have seen me, you have seen. For the Father and I, uh, <laughs> the Jews are going to kill him because of this. I want to kill him. How can you equate yourself with God? By the way, you know, in John chapter 5, verse 18, the Jews wanted to stone Jesus, right? Why do they want to stone him in John 5, 18? Because he said, I am the son of God. And to a Jew, to say you are the son of God is to say you carry the same nature as the one you are a son of. Mtoto wanyoka? Mtoto wa mungu? Si. So when Jesus says, I am the son of God, he is saying, I carry the divine nature. But not only did Jesus say that, we also see in this human being, other writers testifying of something else within him. For example, Paul the Apostle in Romans chapter 9 verse 5, he refers to this Jesus Christ as God. In Titus chapter 2 verse 13, Titus 2 13, again Paul the Apostle refers to this man, this human being, Paul refers to him as our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What are we to make of this human being? What are we to make of him? But not only that, this human being apparently has some supernatural abilities which no other human being has. Right? He has some supernatural ability which no other human being has. In fact, we could say those are abilities that are above humanity. Human beings do not possess that kind of ability, that kind of power. This man, Jesus Christ, so there's something about this human being. There's something about him. For example, this human being alone can defy the force of gravity. Because we do know that gravity tells us that everything that goes up eventually must come down because it is acted upon by forces of gravity at the center of the earth pushing everything down. Unless, of course, you go above the stratosphere, then that's another matter. We know the laws of 
density and volume and weight is that any heavy thing in water will sink unless it is buoyed by some kind of a flotation device. Well, well, this human being called Jesus of Nazareth is able to suspend the laws of nature, torpedo them, supersede them, and is able to walk on water as a man who would walk on dry ground. There's something about this man. You know, when the time comes for him to be lifted up to his father's bosom, to glory, he doesn't need chariots to come like chariots came for Elijah. He doesn't need that. <laughs> A cloud simply descends and the Son of Man simply climbs into the cloud as a man would board a Mercedes Benz and up and up the clouds begin to move and there he goes out of their sight. Completely flabbergasting. Something supernatural about this human being. So, as we begin to deal with the essential identity of this human being called Jesus, we have to reckon necessarily we cannot escape the fact that there is divinity in the man. Hmm? Divine in him. There's something miraculous, there's something supernatural, there's something godly. Godlike even in the man Jesus Christ. So that in his essential identity, ladies and gentlemen, there is bound up, there is bound up the human and the divine, and we'll talk about this in greater detail beyond this introduction to the course. There is bound up within the man, Jesus Christ, the human and the divine, so that the resulting person is somebody we usually call the God man. And that's, that's the only way we can refer to it, because we don't know how to deal with this that we will call the hypostatic union. Later on in our lectures, we will refer to that doctrine as the doctrine of the hypostatic union. This union of two separate natures, you could even say two dichotomous natures, Uniting in one person inseparably, indissolubly, yet as the confessions would say, without confusion, right, and without an amalgamation that disappears either of them. They remain distinct, and I know I'm speaking alone now, okay, that's okay. They remain distinct, yet one. And as we deal with Christological controversies, this is a matter that is going to be absolutely at the center of this whole discussion. So then, we say, we, as we deal with aspects of Christology, we are dealing in the first place with the person of Christ, that is to do with his essential identity, and there are two issues there, his divinity, his humanity all bound up into this one that we call the God-man and we say essentially in this whole matter we are quite concerned with that pivotal doctrine of the incarnation. That is going to be the crux of the matter. That is going to be the heart of the issue that we are going to be dealing with as we go along. But there is a second aspect to Christology which I want us to touch upon very briefly. We're just introducing the course now, okay? Just introducing it now. The second aspect of Christology really is an aspect that pours into soteriology, okay? That will bring us over into soteriology. Um, it is what we are calling the work. Christ. So that was the person of Christ, and then we did in the second place, in terms of aspects of Christology, we did it then with the work of Christ. The work of Christ. His work. 
For ladies and gentlemen, I've told you already as we were dealing with reasons why we must study Christology, that in fact, if you misapprehend, if you misunderstand, if you misjudge, if you confuse the person of Christ, you will have misapprehended, misjudged the whole Christian faith. Now what I'm saying here in this connection is that the person of Christ is bound up inseparably. Now write that down. The person of Christ is bound up inseparably with his work. The person of Christ is bound up inseparably with his work. Now, there's an announcement that comes out in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and he says, Hey, behold, as the prophets have declared, behold, you will conceive and bear a son, and you should call his name what? Jesus, verse 21, for he shall save his people from their sin. So that we no longer just talk about Christ, we're talking about a Christ who has a human name. He is a Christ with a human name. What's the human name? Jesus. But what does that name mean? Savior from sin. So you cannot talk about the person of Christ without talking about the work of Christ. Remember, not only is his human name indicative of his work, Jesus, Savior from sin, Matthew 1, 21. Jesus, Savior from sin. That is his human name. But his divine name. What's his divine name? Christ. That's right. That's what Peter understood, did he not? In Matthew 16. Thou art the Christ. And Jesus replies almost immediately and says, Peter, this is not flesh and blood. What you have now is divine revelation. That I am Christ, you have understood that. That is divine revelation. That is of divine origin. So the name Christ is his divine name. And we say it means the sent one, the chosen one, the promised one, the special one. Huh? The one we've been waiting for from the Old Testament record. He's alive. That divine name also carries his mission. Once you say Christ, you are referring to his mission. The sent one, the anointed one, anointed for what? To save us. The special one. So both in his human identity, Jesus, and his divine identity, Christ, is bound up his work. Does this make sense? <laughs> so that's what you did in the The Christ of our redemption. Christ of our salvation. When you're dealing with his essential identity, you're dealing with his humanity, his divinity, when you're dealing with his work again, you are hacking back to that identity. And we're going to deal with why Christ came. For what reason did he come? Now, this, of course, primarily deals with the question, this is incarnation, this deals particularly with the doctrine of the atonement. All right? So we have two aspects to Christology, really. You have incarnation and then you have the atonement, basically speaking, conceptually speaking. But we're going to open those up in greater detail. In greater detail. Now, it remains for me to read with you then that text I promise I will read, and then I will stop this lecture. Again, I say, we're just introducing this now. So if you would turn very quickly, please, if I may beg your indulgence to do that, Matthew then, Matthew chapter 16. And you know, again, the Lord has had a successful ministry, he's walked with the disciples up until now. He has shown them many miracles. 
They believe in him, they love him. He has sent them out. The ministry is established, it's ongoing, it is progressing. But he comes to a point when this thing must transition now. This thing must change. And he wants to make sure that they are on the same page with him. He wants to be absolutely clear that they are on the same page with him. For this next stage of his redemptive agenda, he has to be with them. So verse 13 then. Matthew 16 from verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Isn't that interesting? He refers to himself as the Son of Man. We'll deal with that. that that's, that's a very high title, actually. It means more than just that he's a human being. It's a messianic title. Okay? Because Daniel sees him in chapter 7. The one receiving a kingdom from the Father is the Son of Man. Nebuchadnezzar saw him <laughs> in the furnace. Alright? So there's more here that we're going to be talking about. Verse 14, they begin to answer. And they say, some say John the Baptist, well, you look like him. You preach like him. Some say Elijah, well, 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 well. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets, because you somehow exhibit some of the characteristics of some of these prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Uh, is that an interesting way of doing things? Who do people say, what's the opinion of others? And they give the opinions. But the opinions of others don't matter. Do they? What matters now is what you think about me. Others have their opinion of who I am. The Muslims think I am a great prophet. That's all I am. The Buddhas and the, the Hindus and the Sikhs, uh, they, they say you are one of the ascended gurus, like Hare Krishna, like Ramayan, and so on and so forth. And, and the New Age movement to say, you are one of the wise men. Who do people say that I am? And people have an opinion about who Jesus is. So he returns the question to them, but who do you say that I am? It's important for me. Verse 16. Simon Peter replied, What? You are the Christ. The Christ. Not a Christ. Go to distinguish between the determinate article there. In the English language, we talk about determinate articles. And when you deal, actually, particularly, you've got a and right an elephant you don't say an elephant you say an elephant isn't it when the noun begins with a vowel sound you begin with that isn't it all right but you say a in the english language is a determinate article that doesn't specify all right you go into that class and call me a student i'm sending say washington over there I say, go into that class and call me a student. Well, it will come and call anyone, isn't it? A student. So long as the one called is a student. But what if I told him, go and call me the student? Washington will stop, won't he? And say, which one? Because determinate article that is a specific reference. And then I say, ah. Is Kennedy I want. And so you'll come and call Kennedy because when I say that, it's a determinate article that is specific. So here, Peter he uses that determinate article that. He says, You are the Christ, not one of the Christ, because there have been many. You are the one, the chosen one, the sent one, the anointed one, the promised one, the Messiah, the one who is to come into the world. You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God, oh dear. 
17. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You're very blessed. You have a favor from the Lord. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. What Jesus is saying here is that this has not come to you because of your effort. Because of your application and exertion. No. This is divine revelation. The Father has drawn the curtains apart and has allowed you access into that which other humans have not been allowed. You've been able to see what many do not see. The curtains have been drawn back so that you've been made privy to the things that are happening behind the scenes, as it were. We have this Jesus we are seeing, but behind him there's a reality greater than what you're seeing. You've been given to see that. So it says here, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then verse 18. And I'll tell you, you are Peter. That's the word Petro, okay? Which really means small stone. And I wish our fellow Catholic friends would uh, understand the distinction. So the Greek there is you are Petros, small stone, insignificant in the circumstances. And on this rock, the word there I think is Petra, alright, as opposed to Petros, the word there is Petra, and this really means rock. On this rock, on this Petra, so what is that rock? Not Christ, not really. So there are two items in front of Jesus. The one is Peter, the person. He has referred to him as Petros, small stone. And then he makes reference to another type of stone, but this is a bigger stone, alright? And he calls it Petra, to distinguish it from Petros. And he says, on this, well, some would say, him as the rock. Surely, he is a rock, isn't he? The stone that the builders rejected, yeah? But I think in context here, he doesn't refer to himself really per se. He refers to the revelation of his person. So yeah, you could say it refers to him, but it's the revelation of his person. The revelation of his identity. The revelation of who is Jesus Christ. So now you understand. Yes, now you know. Yes, now you are clear about who I am. Yes, now I can begin to build my church on that information. Right? This is it now. It says then, I will build my church. And it says, the gates of hell. By the way, even those words that follow qualify of the preceding sentence and the gates of hell doesn't mean literal gates that is a word in scripture that means the teaching of the convictions of the strongholds of so the teachings of hell the doctrines of demons as Paul would call them later the misunderstandings about religion that will come later will not prevail against the church because we know who Jesus is. We have an understanding now. And so later on in John's letter, first letter of John chapter 2 verse 20, first letter of John chapter 2 verse 27, you will see this. It says, and you have received, no it says in verse 20, and you have an unction, an unction from the Holy One, and you know the truth. You know the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth and the life. By the way, in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back in the parousia, we are told at the guard of his garment, there will be words written, the word of God. That is his name. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word became flesh. Hologos Theos, the Word of God. So on this understanding, I'll build my church, and the teachings of hell will not come against it and prevail. Never. It will not happen. Because we know Christ. You know, Paul, Paul would boast on this, wouldn't he? He would say, I know him upon whom I have believed. I know him. In Philippians chapter 3, <coughs> Philippians 3, I believe in verse 9, 10, particularly verse 10, he says that I may know him, Christ. That I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection. Be a partaker of the fellowship of his suffering. Being conformed daily to the manner of his death, so that if by any means, Paul says, I should also attain to the resurrection of the dead. It's, it's, it's something. And I began to tell you then, as we began this lecture, that if you misjudge the person of Christ, you misapprehend the person of Christ, you will misjudge everything about the Christian religion. He's at the center, he is the one. So we must know him. We must know him. We really must know him. Then of course verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so you go on binding demons. There's no demons there, you know? There's no demons. Now I want you to observe verse 20, please. It's, 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 it's funny, you know, I think the old writers used to talk about the messianic secret. Huh? They talked about the messianic secret. There you find it in verse 20. Then he strictly, now they just had that up shaking revelation. They should go out and publish it, go tell it to the mountains. Over the hills and every valley. No, 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 no. After this earth shaking revelation, this knowledge they have, this good beginning, this wonderful foundation now they have, then he strictly charged the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's amazing. And that's, that's, that's going to be a discussion we're going to have uh, in, in, in days that come ahead. But, but, but I'm, 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 just, I'm just fascinated that he would want this to be a secret. By the way, this is something, we're not finding this for the first time. When he raised that child from the dead, remember? I think at nine, he said to the disciples, Let's stay quiet. It does appear there was a secret to be kept for a time until the moment of his manifestation. There was a moment of revelation, and then there would be a moment of manifestation. There was a moment of revelation, and then there would be a moment of manifestation, when he is known to the world. But he has to be known to the world, not in glory, ladies and gentlemen. He has to be known to the world in weakness. That's the Messiah, exactly. That our salvation is going to come not in glory, but in weakness. Not in poor pageantry and color, but in ignominy and infamy and shame. Oh, this one that is the son of the Most High God. This one that has God in him, the God-man, will hang up on the cross naked as he was born. Will be bruised by men. You know, Isaiah saw him 800 years before, 700 years. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was laid upon him. He said, we esteemed him stricken of God, a man acquainted with sorrows and grief, like a root out of dry ground, verse 2. He came out. Who has believed our report, verse 1 of chapter 53? Who has believed it? 
the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. Martin Luther distinguished the theology of Christ and consequently the theology of the Christian church vis-a-vis -vis the gates of hell theology. Now those are my words now, okay? Gates of hell, I'm just leveraging that first step. The gates of hell of relevance. He talked of theologia gloria, Latin for theology of glory. We are overcomers. We are children of the king. We should never suffer. Oh, health and wealth. We are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. Possess theologia gloria. And Luther said, ours is not theologia gloria. Ours is theologia curses. Theology of the cross. Theology of weakness. <laughs> For unless a grain of wheat dies and falls to the ground and is buried and rots, it remains alone. But if it drops to the ground, dies, is buried and rots, it comes out not alone, but it comes out bountiful. So we are there that begin in weakness and end in glory. Not begin in glory and end in weakness, you see. That's why we are so looking forward to the resurrection morning, aren't we? I mean, we are suffering now. The whole creation, Romans chapter 8, groans together in pain from verse 18, waiting for that revelation of the sons of God, to wit, the redemption of our bodies, he says. And of course, 1 Corinthians 15 explains how that resurrection body will be like. It will be a great, glorious, great one. But so far we suffer in weakness and sickness. And, and an infirmity, and all these things attend our after the existence, you know. Theologia Gloria versus Theologia Crusts. So there is this secret here that he conscripts the disciples into. He says, do not tell anyone that I am the Christ, because if they understand that, they will misunderstand my mission. And by the way, many of them did, did they? You know, people like Judas, we're expecting, uh, now we have a leader who will ride on a white stallion, a white mustang, and uh, there you go, a warrior like in the film, eh? leading his troop, and we're going to charge at the Romans, you know, and the Romans are going to be killed. If, if everybody then knows exactly who I am, they will sabotage this thing in their minds. So keep it under wraps, yes? But I want to look at verse 21. We finish there. I could go on and on about this, but look at verse 21. Now, there's a distinction between the hoi polloi, the gandawala, as they call them, what went, okay? And then there is the special ones, the chosen ones, his people. He says to them, don't, don't speak this publicly now. Leave it. But, but you have the revelation, right? You have the information. Now I'm going to bring you to something else. I'm going to show you something that is bound up with my identity. The identity you just discovered. There's something bound up with it which the world cannot understand. For their theologia gloria, they will think, ah, now we have glory and power and greatness. But I want you to understand what is involved in me being Christ. Verse 21. Now, come on, somebody read me the first words. Read me the first words. That's your problem as you read the Bible. You don't read the words. You read as if you just come on, give it. Tom, one, two, three, go. From that time. From that time. Not before. We're in chapter 16 now. So what did you do in chapter 1? In chapter 2, 10, 13, 15. It is from this time. From what time? The time when they have this revelation into who he is, into his person, into his identity, into his work. In a sense, they have been qualified by God to come into greater mystery, to be given more information now. Before you were babies, your children, you are thinking like the rest of Israelites. But now that you know who I am, I want to show you something else that is bound up with who I am. 21, 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples what? That he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. Oh, I think they were disappointed. Where well, was well, Jesus? Without having understood that you're the Christ, the sent one, that, that now, but, but you, you're taking us back to suffering again. And suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And be killed. <laughs> and on the third day, be raised. Ah, Peter will not have it. Peter won't have it. Peter will not have it. I mean, I've just had that revelation about you. And then I'm going to be a to watch him chase one. And Peter took him aside. He said, hey, yes, we put your panic in Come, we must talk. Here to him of Job. And so he, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Saying what? Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. It's foolish, isn't it? It's foolish. Jesus has declared to him the things that happened because he has qualified. But you see, that, that, that's who we are, isn't it? I mean, we, we have this roller coaster experience with God. Sometimes you're up on the mountain, sometimes you're very low in the valley. Peter has had this great revelation, and then he just misunderstands the purpose of that revelation. So, like another man called John the Baptist, yeah? John, 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 John introduces Christ to people. He says, This is the Lamb of God. That takes away the sins of the world. But a few moments later, you know, he's not sure anymore, is he? He's not sure. He says, Go ask him, is he the one or should we wait? So, so we have this roller coaster. Uh, how about Elijah? 450 prophets of Baal and 400 others of Asherah up on the mountain of Carmel. One man against 850 plus the king Ahab on their side. And he said, you make your sacrifice, I'll make mine. We'll see which, who is God between the two. And of course, God shows up. And uh, Elijah single-handedly takes a sword. And he says, of course, we have decided this matter. Jehovah is Lord. And a false prophet must die. That's the Old Testament law. Shingo, 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 shingo. Great victory. And Elijah tells her, now that you have cleansed the land of false prophets, Three years there's not been rain or dew on the earth. I can see rain is coming. Run! Run! And Arab is on his horses. And can you believe it? Elijah runs ahead of horses, we are told. <laughs> and they are running. <laughs> Incredible things happen, yet a woman speaks. A woman called Jezebel says, If the sun goes down tonight with your head still on your shoulder, then I'm not the woman I am. And but it's not woman. And he runs and hides and he wishes that he dies. You know, God take my soul. <laughs> we have this roller coaster, isn't it? We are up on the mountain, then we are down in the valley. <laughs> and that's a life of faith. We are not always strong, are we? I experienced that many times actually. There are days I feel like I have faith I can move a mountain. And then there are days I feel like I'm not even a Christian. <laughs> so and so forth. 